and reflections from a from Zen a Buddhist point of view on uh, both on el election as a phenomenon in itself, elections, and in particular the result of this one that we just had. I'm sure you've been all talking about it, and you're probably tired of talking about it, but uh, I'd like to shed some uh, Buddhist light on it. But to do that, I think we need to, you know, and you'll, you'll see this once I go through it, and apply it, to go back to what the fundamental inspiration is uh, in Buddhism, and that's the life of the Buddha, and particularly the enlightenment experience of Shakyamuni, the uh, historical Buddha. Uh, and the story of his enlightenment is, is fascinating. Uh, you know, we often find it you know, depicted, as you do, you know, the life of Christ in the West, you find the life of the Buddha, uh, you know, in temples, etc., and sculptures, etc. But the, the great uh, enlightenment experience is the first call, the first uh, case, first scenario in uh, one of the uh, collections of the koans called the Nekorobu, which is, means the record of transmitting light, and that exactly, is exactly what happens uh, in the Buddhist experience and in, hopefully in ours as well, which is a, a participation in that, we'll just say a reproduction of it. But, uh, the uh, story is itself is just a, one, one sentence. Uh, Shakyamuni, uh, as he sat under the Bodhi tree the, you know, over during the night, uh, he saw the morning star and was enlightened. We'll talk about what that means, of course. And he said, I and the great earth and all beings simultaneously achieve the way. Or reach my, well, achieve the way, have the experience of what it means to be in And the commentary points out that, so I and the great earth and all beings simultaneously, so everything is included in this experience. Because in the end there's only one Buddha mind, only one light, only one reality, which is what he's experiencing. So as the commentary points out very well, when he says, I, and the great earth. It's not the same I that sat down the night before under the tree, which was, you know, the individual, the separate individual, ego I. Uh, and the whole point of the enlightenment is that that disappears, or that uh, realizes it's much more, less than it thought in terms of, you know, ego, but a whole lot more in terms of its fundamental nature, what a nature. Who it is, Christ nature, if you wish. Um, so uh, the fundamental experience of enlightenment is that, is that you're not separate. And the great illusion, the great ignorance, which is one of the poisons, you know, one of the three, three poisons, as we'll talk about in a second, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is illusion, is, is uh, ignorance illusion. Uh, and that fundamental ignorance of illusion is, is thinking which is already illusion, thinking you're separate. And waking up, becoming the Buddha, in other words, the enlightened one, the awakened one, uh, is to realize that you're not separate. So it has to be the fundamental insight and perspective which governs any reflection on anything, including elections. Uh, it's, uh, it's helpful to uh, compare that to what happened according to the legend to the Buddha during that uh, night. These things happen at night, in case you haven't known as symbolic and real at the same time. Um, he had temptations, kind of like Christ in the desert. He had the temptation, first of all, according to the story of pleasure, greed, you know, voluptuous women coming to fill his imagination and things like that. Uh, and he was able to resist that. So that's the poison of greed, you know wanting an ego fulfillment and this, this satisfaction on that level, uh, uh, which you know, he was able to transcend. And the second temptation was earthquakes and, and, and floods. And so fear, you know, being attached by fear. And that's a big one. I often say, and others have said, you know, 95% of what we do or don't do is, is dictated by fear if you go down rather than, say, love. Um, and the third one was actually self-doubt, which is a biggie. 
we can doubt our ego, but we can't doubt our true self, who we really are. Uh, and he, he, that's what he did, the famous Bodhi Sparsa Mudra, which is that when you touch the earth, you often see the statues of the Buddha most often where he's touching the earth with his right hand. He's calling the earth to witness that he is. He's discovered who he really is, in other words, in relation to the earth, I am the great earth, so, and all beings are simultaneously achieved the way. So there's become fear and greed and ignorance. Uh, hatred and anger is the other, other, uh, uh, the other uh, poison, which of course comes from ignorance and, 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 and fear. Uh, so that's where we're coming from, and that's where we're going to. Uh, other way of saying this is uh, about all being one is uh, an expression which uh, uh, Bernie Glassman, my teacher's teacher, who was a very famous American Zen Buddhist, um, what he calls one body, there's just one body. It's kind of like Christianity when you say there's just one body, the body of Christ, uh, filling the whole universe, which is what St. Paul says in the New Testament. Um, so there's this, in an infinity perspective, however you want to envision it, there's just one body, one Buddha body, one Buddha nature, which we are, not only participate in, but which we are. So he, he does put it this way. He, he, he refers back to this, this Shakyamuni enlightenment, and he says, uh, when he said that above and below the heavens throughout the whole universe, I alone am, which means that I, which is the Buddha, not the I, which is the ego. It contains everything. Nothing is left out or excluded. All is one body. This is, this is, this is book, The Infinite Circle. This is a commentary on a couple of the sutras. So every idea we have binds and restricts us. So way beyond our ego mind here. When we let go of all our ideas, there's no, there aren't any limitations. It's a boundless, vast universe, as the Zen's often say. And that's what's so wonderful. We say that we're limited in such and such a way. For example, we can't fly. But these are, no, these are just not notions. If I can see life as one body, then of course I can fly. I can do anything because I'm everything. Which I, of course, could. And I'm doing it right now. Right now you're flying. I'm circling the Earth, circling Mars, creating stars. If I say I can't fly, all that really means is that my concept of I can't fly. Because my idea of me is this limited bound self, and I don't see that I'm one with the ego. So you really are simultaneously one with all things, including the eagle. So you're flying. And you can actually experience that. It's not just saying, oh, I must be able to fly since I'm one with the eagle, and I know the eagle flies. No. It's actually part of the experience. So as a boundless, unlimited being, I can certainly fly. So not only are you one with everything, but this is the boundlessness of the well, you know, and you know, modern science, you know, in the limitless universe is confirming all the spiritual insights of the mystics for the past 2,500 years. Uh, everything from astrophysics to biochemistry teaches that there's this dynamic, inherent interconnectedness of everything. So that is actually what the experience is. Uh, or as this uh, watercolor done by my teacher, uh, calligraphy, says a quote from Dogen, who was the founder of Zen Buddhism in Japan in the 13th century. Boundless, it's called. The true person and who you really are. Is not anyone in particular. But like the deep blue color of the limitless sky, it is everyone. Everywhere. So you literally are everyone. If you want to, if you want to put it in terms of we, you are the Buddha, and everyone is the Buddha, there's just one Buddha nature in Christianity. There's just one Christ. The one Christ, we're all Christ. If you want to express it that way, but they're for one body. So we really are everyone else. And, and to conclude this part of the presentation, you know, there's a really funny poem which I, I always quote. It's one of my favorites, the 68th one in, the, in what's called the Blue Fifth Record, uh, which illustrates this very, very almost almost in a comic way. It's very, very, very short. Uh, two uh, two monks are sitting with each other. And the names in Chinese are a little too complicated, and they use double names, so we'll just say Jack and Tom. So Jack says to Tom, 
What's your name? And Tom says, Jack. And Jack says, my name is Jack. And then Tom says, well, I'm Tom. And then they laugh. And that's the story. So Jack asks Tom what his name, and Tom says, I'm Jack. Because he is. It's not just Tom. It's not just his limited you know, self. He's the other guy, too. It's all one body. It's all one reality. So you're each other. There is no other, as the Bible says. There is no other. You just shouldn't be afraid of the other or hate the other because you're just afraid of yourself and you're hating yourself. Because you are the other. It's just like when Jesus says, you know, whatever you do to the least of these brothers and sisters, you're doing to me. And in fact, it's me doing it to me. Really. So this is this should literally blow your mind. I hope it does, because your mind is in the way. You know, it's defined in limited, limiting in limited categories. Uh, so you can bounce back and forth between you, between you being your individual self, your universal self, your true self. You're not, you're not a prisoner of your evil self. So, how do you apply this to elections? Well, first of all, the phenomenon of the having elections at all, that's, it's based obviously on the dignity of the human person and the rights of the human person. And this is a very, very modern concept, but it shouldn't be. But it is. We can ask ourselves why the religions of the world, including Buddhism, were so long in drawing the conclusions, you know, of the own system. That if everyone is the Buddha, if everyone has this Buddha nature, if everyone is is the whole, I mean, how how can you not have infinite respect for every person? Maybe it's the sense that the individual is, is fleeting. Then that's just an abstraction. Um, and politically speaking, you know, it's obviously a modern system, a modern democracy. Even in Athens, it was, you know, just the uh, property of males or whatever it was at the time. So it was limited. Uh, so politically speaking, we, 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 we have that'd be another whole discussion, another whole course. You know, why haven't we been more sensitive to this in terms of? Uh, you know, in China and Japan, they lived under shoguns and emperors. Today, in North Korea, you know, they all move in like one, like one behind. You know, no individuality at all. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the fundamental insight is there, which then led us to this uh, respect for the human rights. Um, but the phenomenon of saying we have different opinions and we're going to vote—that's tricky, right? Who's has an opinion and who's voting to defend what opinion? And where is it coming from? So that's what we always have to ask ourselves as we exercise our, the, the, the right of our true selves and if we try to act from our true selves. Where is my view, insofar as I have a view, stuff coming from? Because in itself, it's dichotomous and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's dualities which you try to overcome, or to all overcome in the ultimate. So we have to ask ourselves, is my view coming from greed, hatred, anger, and ignorance, and fear? And to what extent am I being motivated by those things in my opinion, about anything, but political opinions also, and how I, how I vote in function of that? So the more enlightened you are, the more you're aware of the danger of voting for those lesser motives. Another aspect. You'll be able to sympathize, because you're one with them after all, and you know yourself, uh, with where other people are coming from. Including if they're coming from their own greed, hatred, and ignorance. But you'll have a fundamental compassion for it, and the ability to empathize. Where are they coming? What is their life experience? You know, because it's as the ancient Roman poet said, it's nothing human, it's alien to me, which is, of course, part of the first insight that I've been talking about, the Christian one as well. Uh, so you'll be able to recognize yourself and the other, even in, even in what might be just partial opinions, and in both senses of the word partial. Uh, so that you don't 
utterly dismiss or simply act with fear, anger, hatred, ignorance, you know, in relation to someone else's opinion, even if it's not enlightened, because you're, it's you. And that really was brought home to me, you know, years ago in, on 9-11. Um, my sensei at the time, uh, Jenna Nables, who still has his end of, in, in Chelsea, um, she said right afterwards, you know, we're the terrorists. Or as Brain said to one of the activists in El Salvador at the time, you know, you're the you're the death squad. That's that's tough to hear. But they're you. Not just that you have the potential to act the same way, but, but literally they're you. So you have to kind of take that on, you know, digest it, you know, metabolize it, change it, you know, in your own heart. You know. The way the Tongva meditation does in the Tibetan tradition, you take on, you know your own heart and change it. You know? uh, or that's what we mean, believe it or not, by saying Christ died for our sins on the cross. He took all that on himself. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So uh, so that those are parts of, of it, you know. Where are we coming from when we have our opinion? And even if we disagree with someone else, to be able to sympathize and empathize with and try to understand where they're coming from, wherever it is, enlightened or not so enlightened, because they're us. And that can really be the way forward in the present circumstances, you know, when we have so, so much inability to communicate with, with each other, even to talk reasonably and calmly with each other about such diverse opinions that we have. Uh, we have to be able, first of all, see where am I coming from? And be able to really enter into our other self, ourself, the other person, Tom and Jack, and say, well, where are they coming from? And be able to sympathize with what has brought them to where they are, why they think the way they do, and they'd be able to work with that. Not get all immediately, uh, you or me, uh, you know, create, create distance and enmity, but, but say, you know, well, we're in this together, we are the same. We're one Buddha, or one Christ, that can we talk? And try and appreciate and welcome each other. And maybe even grow together. Grow together through that process. Not only learning from each other, but growing by the very process of of being able to share and being able to rise to a higher level of identification, ultimately identity, with, with, with quotes the other, which doesn't even exist on my level. And, and, and one final point, which I think is pretty obvious already from what I said. Uh, uh, we can't support any view we can sympathize where people are coming from, as I say, but we can't ultimately support and much less uh, propose from ourselves or support from ourselves uh, any of you which uh, does not have compassion, uh, which is not, does not recognize the inherent dignity, the Buddha, Christ nature of everyone, and seek to have compassion on that, uh, to help it grow you know, in the midst of a world of continual change, as the Buddhists have said very well, and the Christians too. Everything is changing, everything is, is fragile. So have that compassion, recognizing the dignity and the fragility of everything and to further that. So we can't act out of fear, hatred, anger, anger ignorance, greed. And there's a whole lot of that out there now. So we have to call that out, ultimately. Even as we dialogue with others, we have to call that out as best we can you know, in ourselves first and in others. Uh, xenophobia, homophobia, whatever it might be, you know, sexism, you know, uh, all that stuff which comes from fear, greed, hatred, and ignorance, and anger uh, is not uh, going to be acceptable. Uh, it not, does not correspond to who we all really are. So neither in the positions we have, nor in the way we react to others' positions, can we have fear, anger, hatred? Hillary Clinton is the Buddha. Donald Trump is the Buddha. And they're both us. And we can meditate on that for probably a couple of decades. But that's really what, what the, the Buddhist tradition and ultimately the Judeo-Christian tradition says. Uh, 
uh, about our being one. Uh, so we're not only united as Americans, we're not just red and, red and blue. You know. uh, we're united not just as Buddhists and Christians and Jews, you know, or whatever it might be, we're united as uh, humans, you know, as citizens of the universe. It's one reality. Hopefully we can say one day when we look at the morning star, I am the great earth and all beings have awakened. What a different world that would be. So, any, any comments or questions? Jess? Like going back to the death squads. You want to? Yes. Okay. So, like when you talk about calling out, there's, there, I mean, like, it takes a certain level of spiritual maturity. Huge level. To be un- moved by threats of violence. Yes. Yes, so? Can you please <laughs> talk a little bit more about the relationship between not acting based on fear yeah. and the existence of the threat of violence? Yeah, that's a good point. And it comes up both in Christianity and in Zen and Buddhism. Uh, that the ones who are really, really enlightened are the ones that never respond with violence, to violence. The threat or the actual, uh, actual uh, manifestation of violence. They don't react violently to that. I think there's a story about, uh, there's a Zen story about, you know, an invader, some samurai from the, you know, coming in and into the monk's place and branching his sword. And said, uh, are you afraid of me that I'm here with my sword? And the monk six looks up at him and says, Are you afraid of me that I don't care? And of course, the guy left. How can you threaten this guy? He can't be threatened. We'd rather die than be, uh, be separate. Um, so it, it requires a huge, the same thing with all the, all the non-violence of Gandhi or Martin Luther King, uh, it, it's all based on a huge, huge amount of spiritual discipline and huge spiritual maturity, absolutely. And especially in the face of violence, to react non-violently. That's what Jesus did too, of course. Um, uh, and the Buddha had his cousin who was his persecutor too, if you know the story of his life, according to that. But you, you uh, Violence begets violence unless you put a stop to it somewhere. Which is what happened on the cross with Jesus, that's what happened with Gandhi's own life. Event. But uh, that's a very good point. Though, yeah. Actually, that was a question. I'm raising it as a question. For, for those, I mean, because obviously you shouldn't blame yourself for, you know, for not having the courage of a martyr. No, but you should recognize that it's, you're not you know, you're not awakened, fully awakened yet. You can say that without hating yourself. You can just realize you're on your path. But then, how does one respond given the fact that they are, they are not that they may not be capable of? Well, what not. do you think? I think you respond as best you can under the circumstances. Okay. And most people will take some kind of steps, probably, than even you know. Even if it's self-defense, violent self-defense, especially if it involves others, then it's even more tricky, of course. But there's no question that that's the idea. I mean, at least you'd be able to recognize that as that's an idea. So, in Christianity, there's an antichrist. But in Buddhism, I've never heard of the anti-Buddha. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm guessing, is there no anti-Christ? Is there no anti-Buddha? Is everyone the Buddha? And, well, and, uh, uh, the, uh, the word anti-Christ is, is, is just doesn't even appear in the Book of Revelation. It just appears in the Epistle of John. And it's, it basically means anything that's contrary to Christ. And according to the letter of John, it was the people who were denying Christ right there in, that, in the second cent the beginning of the second century AD. So uh, you can say very simply, whatever fights against the ideal and the reality of Christ, you know, the ultimate 
enlightened, compassionate one is anti-Christ. And the same with the Buddha. Even though they don't use the expression, whatever, uh, po whatever the poison, whatever the, uh, the force which acts contrary to, to the enlightened, compassionate one, that is the Buddha, is the anti Buddha. And most of it's not, of course. We shouldn't be looking, oh, there's the Antichrist. It's just a projection of our own stuff, most of the time. Besides, they're us, after all. So, why well, project it? Any other reflections? You know, this may take, you know, three or four or five decades to live up to it. It's, 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 at least it's good to have the goal. And I don't have to, I don't have to dot my eyes and connect the thoughts to how, you know, how it applies to the election. You know, this, the kind of rhetoric that's used during the election. Not only towards others, but you know, within, within the, the parties themselves. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying about making everybody, uh, I'm sorry, about understanding that you and everybody are essentially the same thing at some level. Yeah. Um, that's really nice for my peace of mind and others' peace of mind and things like that, but, but what do you do with that knowledge in order to bring the world where you want it to go? Or you know, what? No, that, that, I, would, I, would, I understand what you're saying, but I would never say it's nice for my peace of mind. It, it's not at all. It's, it's horrible, incredibly challenging, and, and bring a lot of, a lot of inner, not peace of mind, but to put it into practice, you know, until, until you, we get to a higher level where we discover a higher peace, a deeper peace. Um, but, but no, in terms of, in terms of when, you, when you're really trying to be attuned, this is what contemplative attitude is, when you're trying to really be here now, and be contemplative, that's to say, really awake to the reality in front of you, the people in front of you, the event, your own reality, which is all connected, uh, then you'll get to be inspired. You'll get the light, you know, deep within you to see how am I most deeply called to respond to this person or this event or this situation here and now. And he makes a lot of that here too. You, you, you'll know from the situation itself because you'll be fully attuned to it, fully connected to all the forces at work. You'll be able to not only see but have the strength to respond, you know, in an appropriate way. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has a metaphor using cookie dough. It says that like like cookies, we all start from the same dough, and then we kind of forget our origins once we're baked. <laughs> when we're part of the life, or you know, we try to like judge each other on our outside, and that sort of thing. And I think that metaphor is just really brilliant. Get distracted from my people and others' deeper selves. So anyone else? Well, so I don't know what time you should break up. You know, I don't talk to all these most teachers, guys. Maybe I did it.